appears in the slide, but I especially want to thank M. Chase, Sabil, the English Department, Hawaii New Ikea, and Seed Ideas. I also want to thank everyone contributing to this visit, setting up chairs, sharing poems and songs. I especially want to thank Joan Kahi. I wish she was here because I think it probably is not an exaggeration to say there have been over a thousand emails um, to, to set this up from her end. And also as Shankar, Mehea, Hia, Sheka, Al Ghazawi, Aldi Musle, who did the beautiful um, designing of the flyers, and Ihiwani Laskonia. I also want to make sure that you know about the Saturday event that is happening at Al Puni Space Art and Activism from Hawaii to Palestine. And just one last announcement is that you can get prints and books. Um, some of the proceeds will be going to the rebuilding of Gaza. So I first encountered um, Malak Matar's artwork in 2016. She was 16 and had been painting since 2014 in response to the 2014 Israeli siege on Gaza, the fourth she had experienced at age 14. During 51 days that summer in its 14th military campaign since unilaterally disengaging from Gaza in 2005, Israel killed over 2,200 Palestinians, 521 of them children. Under these horrific conditions, Malak began painting. When I saw her paintings circulating on Facebook, they stopped me in my tracks. The news from Palestine and especially Gaza continued to be horrifying. These images captured the pain and violence of the Israeli occupation of Palestine, and they also showed the world an artist who brings beauty, steadfastness, and freedom dreams of the people, and especially the women and girls of Gaza. To see such beauty exist, despite and as a counter to Israeli violence that is at once shocking and predictable, to see a girl able through art to envision an opening up of the bars of the world's largest air pr open air prison was truly humbling. And as we all sit here today, with the heaviness of an unfolding genocide, I'm sorry. I also want to say that Malek's traveling to be with us at a time of extreme precarity and horror is an assertion of courage, beauty, and strength that is everywhere in her artwork. As Ravif Ziada proclaimed in a poem addressed to a TV journalist, we teach life, sir, and Malak's presence with us today, as do her paintings, surely do just that. I bought one of those paintings in 2016. I remember uh, the experience of having, um, of figuring out how to send the money for the paintings to Malak through Western Union. 
In a safe way in Lanoa, I spent a good hour with a Western Union guy who, after many go-rounds, finally insisted the money be routed to Israel. The money did not reach Malak. I will not retrace all the tedious next steps, but I learned that as far as Western Union is concerned, Gaza does not exist. I mention this only to say that the violences of occupation are not limited to the terrifying war crimes and crimes against humanity, the genocide that we are currently witnessing, however distorted the images the main media shows us. When Gaza is not in the news, the violence continues and infiltrates every aspect of Palestinian life. It is why when Malak traveled from Gaza to London a few weeks ago, she needed to send her portrait of Fadwa Khan that we will be unveiling shortly through DHL, and may I curse them forevermore after this experience of the past week, because there was no assurance that a painting of a poet surrounded by flowers in a palette of lavenders and buttery yellows would make it across the border. And it may be why the tale of getting to con to you today has been full of what DHL calls exceptions and their delivery failures. And rightly so. As such images are indeed dangerous to the Israeli state, um, disrupting as they do the Zionist narrative that would have the world understand Palestinians either as terrorists and anti-Semites or as non-existent, or as just so many dead bodies. Since 2014, Malik has gone on to become a world-renowned painter. Exhibits of her work have been held in galleries and museums around the world. Her paintings have been featured in individual and group exhibitions in Costa Rica, England, France, Germany, Holland, India, Italy, Palestine, Scotland, Spain, Switzerland, Turkey, and 11 US states, and I'm sure that list needs updating. She also wrote and illustrated City's Bird, a children's book based on her own life story, um, and that's what's available back there. A star student in Palestine, she achieved the highest GPA in the Gaza Strip in 2017, and I happen to know how many spectacular students there are coming out of Gaza. Um, she went on to receive her BA in English from Istanbul Aydin University, and has just started graduate school in London at Central St. Martin's, uh, the, one of the top two most prestigious MFA programs. To have Malik come here has been a dream come true. It has been a dream in the making for many years. I think we started in 2018 on this visit. For Malik to get her visa was a long and stressful process full of violent absurdities interrupted by Israel's intermittent bombings and by a pandemic. It was accomplished in part with help from Yusuf Al-Jamal also from Gaza, who visited UH as part of SSJP at UH's decolonial November series that Malak is also a part of. And if there ever was a need for decolonial November to come early, this year is surely it. And, and I want to mention that, that Yusuf has lost nine family members this week. These decolonial November visits, which started in 2014, have included a powerful lineup of Palestinian friends, and with them we have built Pilina from Hawaii to Palestine. These bonds will continue to strengthen with Malak's visit here, including on Saturday and also today. Um, and please do join us after this um, event for a reception at the John Young Museum Courtyard. This will feature music and poetry um, by Mahea Ahia, Ihiloni Lasconia, um, Brandy Nalani McDougall, Heoli Osorio, and John Osorio. It's a really good lineup, right? <laughs> we are particularly excited that this visit will also endure through Bullock's beautiful artwork, a print of her painting of Haunoni K. Trask, commissioned by Kuloha Homanabanui, and you can see the print ver version there. Um, and, and thank you to Kualoha for allowing limited runs of the print for this portrait to be available uh, for sale today. We'll be placed next to a portrait of, um, of a poet very dear to Haunani K. Trask's heart, Bagwa Takan, which we will unveil for you soon. It's under that sheet. Um, to place these portraits side by side in this room where we hold our department meetings and events, is part of our efforts to strengthen solidarity from Hawaii to Palestine and with our friends and colleagues in English to decolonize the UHM English department. 
As with her other paintings, this one is a portal. The, woman, the women in Moloch's paintings hold whole worlds in their bodies. Let's see if this is more. Yeah, there we go. Um, their dreams are not ones that drones can demolish or drown out. To have the presence of these paintings in this room is a gift. I also hope it is a provocation, a reminder of our kuleana to do what we can to make a world as beautiful as they are and to stop the violence that we are now seeing. Please join me in welcoming this extraordinary artist and in thanking her for being with us during a time of unimaginable stress and duress. Malak, I hope we can hold you with the love, the strength, the kindness, and the beauty that comes from your art. And before we turn things over to you, I am so happy to welcome Josie Brody, PhD student in American Studies, SFGP at UH member, who has written a poem for Malak. so much for being here. Um, I wrote this poem over the last uh, month or so since Cindy suggested that it was something I might do. Um, <laughs> and um, it, I spent a lot of time uh, on uh, Malat's Etsy <laughs> um, and on Google image searches and just with these beautiful paintings that are over to my left. Um, and it was a really amazing space and so this poem sort of came out of me trying to process like how these paintings can me clarify or or be a part of my being as a jewish japanese person currently occupying the unceded lands of hawaii um so thank you guys um, this is really cradle verb to protect, to support protectively or intimately, to fashion yourself horizontal, to grow four strong arms, be a mother to a daughter, a daughter to a grandmother, a sister to a dog, to nurture fruit like it might feed all your kin. This is gonna be hard. Okay. Cradle, noun, a rocking device used in panning for gold. My granny's hands steady, cutting the umbilical cords of lemons and avocados. What the land of the Lisenio people produces, I bury in a suitcase between clothes and books for TSA to excavate. Swollen citrus, mild pink gold of pomelo roped by latex gloves. A six hour flight away, my other grandmother pans latkes out of oil. How is it that we're taught to fall in love with extraction? How can I eat strawberry guava without blaming the fruit for the blood on my lips? Cradle, verb, to cut grain to the cradle side. Harvest, we hack at a forest of invasive ginger here in Hawaii. I cut my thumb and worry the wound. Afraid the ginger will reroot in my body, making me the guest who is host to a settler. Cradle, noun, a place of origin. Yesterday, the images appeared on my phone of bulldozers knocking down the Gaza wall, people returning to their places of original resistance. Unprecedented, my phone tells me. Let us unfold together a precedent of girls with soaring braids and sad-eyed birds and the butter-sweet waters Palestinians traveled to learn guerrilla tactics in North Vietnam. The precedent in the linking of arms on Alcatraz Island, Palestinians and Turtle Island indigenous people breathing the sun together. Cradle, synonyms. Birthplace, home, mother country, motherland. Meadowed quilts and dove lovely dresses, mapping living, blooming lands onto bodies. When the world sleeps, your paintings seem to me to say, the body forgets to pretend to be distinct from its cradle. Um, 
Um, hello, everyone. I'd first love to thank you for this very warm welcoming. Thank you, Sinitia, for your introduction. That was a lot, and it was very expressive about my life and, and its journey. Uh, thank you for the flowers. They smell wonderful. And thank you for the poem. That was really emotional. Uh, speaking here today is, is very hard. Um, how not to be emotional. Um, I'll just have a moment. The worst part of it is not being able to be in touch with my family, not being able to know if we are alive or not. Because of the occupation of Israel, they are disconnecting internet, banning electricity, banning water, banning life into the Gaza Strip. <laughs> I need to be emotional in camera, but I have to. Um, I grew up in the Gaza Strip uh, with my family and friends. I remember we had beautiful time and also upsetting time. I used to go to school. We as family, we were very, disconne very connected. Um, as a child, we were participants to the culture and life. I remember vividly my grandmother asking me and asking my cousins to collect of harvesting and oranges. This was the perfect day, and I, 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 I wish I have done it even more, given now that Gaza Strip is getting wiped out of the history. Not only by Israel, but also by the U.S., enabled by your tax money. I do not need your sympathy. I need your action, because you, your tax money, are making genocide in the Gaza Strip. I was a young kid, I was going to my art school, um, not art school, I was going to my school, and I have, with my siblings, went to do my final exams, and suddenly we were asked to evacuate the school, that was in 2008, and I was like, I looked up in the sky and there was warplanes, it was a great day and hundreds of people, young children, were asked to leave. I was collected by my mom. I arrived to my house and it was like, oh, it was just my school being in danger. Now I'm in safety. And that was the first massacre I ever had witnessed as a child. Again, going back to normal in 2012, going back, I survived the second Israeli assault, losing family members, losing the house, uh, relatives losing houses, but most importantly, losing a childhood where over one million children live in the Gaza Strip, and that you don't hear about unless the media shows you slaughtered images of kids. I don't mean the BBC, the New York Times, the CNN. They are the source of propaganda. And I would ask all of you to make complaints about how they are fabricating the stories, how they're using the images of my people's dead, killed buddies as, 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 as their children. We're not only fighting the Israeli occupation, but we're fighting a media war that is not telling you the truth of how much we've been massacred for 75 years under siege, under military siege for 17 years. It's almost all I, I lived through. So that is one of my painting about returning back from school to go to the sea. And it was a memory from going to school with other students as a trip to the sea which has now became a very aggressive element in a state of a beauty element because we're being bombed from the boats from the, bo from the sea. What is happening now in 7th of October, there was a, a genocide started. I was in Gaza just in the 6th of October. I, I came to London in the 6th of October after celebrating my sister's wedding. I was stuck in the Gaza Strip for three weeks, losing one, two, and three weeks of my master's that I have started. But I finally was able to leave my, my home back, and that was the final day that the border was ever open to. It now has been bombed. The Rafah crossing border, which is the Egyptian side of the Gaza Strip, has been bombed four times, and humanitarian aids. People are starving with no food, no water. You know how doctors are cleaning the injury of people? Using vinegars, because they are not able to use medical supplies to treat people.
people are smelling and, and the insects are coming to their injuries. They are getting amputated every day because there is no medical supplies. Israel is banning them. So when you hear that there is somebody has been injured, it means that they are the future murder in a matter of days. We're talking about 10,000 people who've been announced killed, and that's only what we've known of. There are 6,000 people missing under the rebels. But even when the medics, even when the medics try to get the people out of the rubble, they are being, being killed. 22 ambulances have been bombed by the airstrikes, killing medics, killing health workers, and also killing the people inside. The injured people who have a fraction of life possibility have been terminated. Now we're talking about the peaceful evacuation. We want the safety of the civilians, right? Israel told people to evacuate from the north and south. And they have 24 hours to evacuate. And guess what? In the safe road for people to evacuate from the north, we're speaking about 2,300,000 people living in a tiny piece of land, 365 kilometers. And people, 1 million of them, 1.1 million, had to evacuate from the north to the, th to the south. And guess what happened? They were getting bombarded while they were evacuating. A whole truck was bombarded, causing an immediate death and killing of 70 people who were evacuating. So this is the safety. Now the, the south that people have went to, it's also getting bombarded. So we're speaking, of, where's the safety? I will tell you more about the shelters. Yes, we have shelters and we can be safe. Guess what? Schools have been bombed, including my mom's school, who's an English teacher. A hospital has been bombed, the, church, the Christian hospital, causing the immediate death of a thousand people. And not only the people who were there are patients, there are people who have become displaced and, and seeking shelter in a hospital because who can imagine that a hospital can be bombed? Doctors, nurses, medical health workers, patients. Be, and what? And guess what? The media is telling you, oh, it was a mistake. No. The hospital uh, was asked to evacuate one hour. So as 22 hospitals were asked to evacuate, but the doctors have decided not to evacuate because evacuating means the death of thousands of people who are living by machines and who are living in a critical condition and, and amputated arms and, leg, and legs. This is the, chair, that is the Christian uh, hospital. A thousand people were killed. And guess what? Did Israel stop at this point? It did not. It has committed hundreds of massacres after this hospital was bombed. So who stopped it? Nobody stopped Israel from committing crimes. And guess what today happened? The church, the Saint Phosphorus Orthodox Church. So just in case, yeah, Muslims are terrorists, okay, but what about Christians? This is just to tell you that Palestinians, all of them, are terrorists according to international law and according to Israel. My friend's family have evacuated to the church, as so as 400 Christians have sought refuge in the church and they, it has been bombed, causing casualties. So imagine, and as well, schools, church, as well the hospital. So where do people go? Where do people go? They were told to evacuate in the south and they're still bombarding the south. So I've speak spoken before about the limited medical supplies. Now the electricity has been off the entire Gaza Strip. Hospitals do not have electricity. They do not have water. People are dying from thirst. They do not have food. And there's tons of, of trucks of food are waiting outside of the border and they are not allowed entry. People are starving. If not from the Israeli missiles, they will be starving from the lack of food. And guess what? Israel is not allowing the food to get in. I would hate to minimize our cause to be the lack of food and starvation. It's more than this. It's 75 years of everyday murder, of apartheid, of human beings being stripped out of their human rights. We are stateless people, have no right to travel, no right to, to have a decent life, no right to even, even the food that we eat is calculated by Israel. The, the, the water we drink is undrinkable. We're speaking about people who, who are just wanting to live. And now they are telling you that what is going on is unprovoked. No, we've died just to live. Is this too much to ask? It's just to live a life with the freedom. We want to be free. 
My life is as precious as your life. The 10,000 people who've been killed is as precious as any person with blue eyes and white, white skin. We are precious and we refuse to be numbers. We refuse to only be statistics. And that's why I'm sharing with you my colleagues, the artists who've been killed at this uh, genocide. This is one of the paintings by Muhammad Sami. He was my age and he was you know, he was, he dreamt of becoming an artist. He's been very active, making murals, working with young children into becoming an artist and expressing himself. Guess what? He's been killed. Muhammad is not a number, although he is. For the media, for the West, he is a number. Heba Zakut, she's, she was a woman, she was a Palestinian, and she was a mother. And guess what happened? She was also massacred with all her children and all her paintings are also under the rubbles. That was Heba and her children. I want to say about the Great March of Return because it's something that you will not see in the media. But it's our attempts for five, six years since 2018. Every single Friday, 20,000 people take the streets to just on the border, to just call for their rights, just to tell the people that we dream to step on the land of our occupied ancestors. We just want to return. We want to work. We want to have a life. And guess what? Over like around 300 of people were killed by the Israeli snipers where, while they were protesting. People, the Israeli snipers was very smart. You know why? Because they want to paralyze the youth. They only targeted the, ampute the legs of these young, young men. In my last visit, the, the city was filled of people with no legs. And tell me this is not an attempt to kill the soul and the spirits of our young people. One of these people who were killed was Razan al Najjar. She was a medic. She was wearing her, like, this is what she was wearing. When the Israeli sniper sh shot her in the chest, she was in her duty saving the lives of injured people who were peacefully protesting to get their rights of return. And also, journalists were killed. Yasser Murtaja, he was a journalist, he was a war journalist, he was also killed. So, as my friend Ibrahim Lafi, he was a journalist, he was killed a few days ago, and he was such a brilliant photographer. He took amazing photos of the port, of the people, of hope, of, of the young people who were dreaming of having a life. That's also um, as a way of killing the people who were protesting. Guess what they did? They threw tear gases on the young, on the protesters, causing the murder of all the young children because they could, their lungs could not bear uh, the smell of these tear gases that is prohibited by the law, by the way. So that was the youngest one who was killed. She was only six months. Her name is Leila Gandur. She inhaled this gas and she was dead. She was killed. So as many young people who could not smell these tear gases. So now to speak about pregnant women. There is around 50,000 pregnant women who are now taking shelters in schools, in churches, and also hospitals. A lot of these people, and I, would, I did not want to share these footages, but they were murdered inside with, with their kids, with their infants inside. And doctors were trying to save these unborn babies to give them life, and none of these babies survived. All the mothers who were pregnant, who were almost giving labor, none of them survived. As, so as the babies have died, not only from the lack of oxygen, but from the trauma that mothers have to witness. This painting was not made for this. This painting was made for Anharid Deek, who was a prisoner in the Israeli prison. She was almost giving labor, few days from giving labor, and she was arrested. In a, con in a solitary consi confinement, and she was not allowed to go to hospital to give birth. So she wrote a long letter calling for the international community, which I don't think exists anymore for Palestinians. And she asked them, please release me. I want to give birth to a healthy, to a healthy baby inside a hospital. And guess what? She was released just a day before, and she was given birth. But other women, they had to give birth inside a prison cell without any medical assistance. We're talking about pregnancy, and a lot of you maybe have been pregnant and know what it takes, what it feels like to be pregnant. I don't know, but I can imagine. So, uh, yeah. 
So here is a brick. Maybe you like ice cream. Maybe that's good to look at. It's refreshing, right? So there is a story. I'm, I'm sure that uh, all children, they do love ice cream, especially in the summer. But guess why do, how do you use ice cream truck for? For the killed bodies of children. To keep them from dissolving and making a smell. Hundreds of children, when they are killed, they are put inside this frozen truck. Can you imagine? And that's why we, I was having dinner yesterday with Cynthia and we were sharing ice cream. I told her, I'm sorry, I cannot eat this ice cream. How can I not? We're full of trauma. Everything is traumatizing. And guess what? Because children are scared to die without being announced. Their names, they write their names on the palm of their, of the palm of their hands. So when they are killed, Nobody will, no, will, they will know who this kid belonged to. And I will, I will quote Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta when he said, there is nothing loneliness than wounded children with no surviving families. And the hospital is filled with these children who have no surviving families, no support whatsoever. And these children, they don't know, we don't know their names. So what their child did, Aya Abdurrahman Shahwan, she wrote her name in the bomb and she was killed. But at least we know her name. And that is enough to tell the world that this girl, Aya, is not a number. She wrote her, her name in the bombs so that people can know who she is. Today, I really... Some of you, uh, in, in some of my talks, people come to me saying, we're sorry for what our country is doing to your people. But guess what? The 1,500 people, children who've been killed, will not accept your apology. Everybody is responsible. Especially your, your tax money is enabling this. And I know you don't support this. If you are a human being with moral obligation, you're not supporting it. But I'm asking you now to take an action. We do not need sympathy. It has never brought us a life. It has never brought the 10,000 people who have been murdered alive. But your action to press in your representative, in your Congress, in talking to your friends, don't be afraid. Your fear is secondary. It's trivial, it's silly when it comes to the woman, to the, the mother who's afraid of her children, for her children's life, including my mom, who has to protect her, her kids. But she has no power whatsoever to protect them. We need your action. You're afraid for your status, you're afraid for your friends disliking you, but you're standing in the wrong side of history when you choose to be neutral, because guess what? Neutrality is taking the side of colonial settler who is trying to strip us from very simple rights of just living, of surviving. They are wiping out my city, the city that I grew up with, that I had the best time in. I'll go back to a place that I do not recognize because of the U.S. support. Guess what? Yesterday there was supposed to be a ceasefire where 500 lives would have been alive today. But guess what? The U.S. has voted against the ceasefire. They voted against the ceasefire because guess what? We don't count. The, the people's lives do not matter. But guess what? We matter. We have stories. We're not numbers. Fuck numbers. We have stories. And we have ambitions. We have dreams. And we have lives. Our souls are not cheap. No matter how the media tries to tell you we're terrorists and we deserve to be alive and you know what, it's, it's war that's not, that will happen. No, we, have, we need to be alive and this is our mission in life, to live a life with freedom and dignity. 75 years is the longest occupation in the contemporary history and we're fed up. And guess what, we're called unprovoked. No, we've been protesting for five years every Friday. People go on, on the border to losing their lives just because they want to live. We are the most educated nation in the world. All the people I know have went into education. They, get, they are in debt just because they want to education. And they want to build a life for themselves. They want to have family. That's why I don't know what, to, what else to add to this. But, uh, yeah, I don't... That's all for now. And I... I'm not... That, 
Yeah, I want to share the video. Thank you. But do you have it? I send it to you by your email. Now there is a video. Um, it was a bit dark. I hope you will, you know, survive the trauma of what I shared. But now I have um, a song that you will really like. It will cheer you up. Um, I don't know if you'll eat ice cream after that, but um, I don't. And uh, this is just a simple act. A lot of tri things trigger me as a person, but I still resist. And I will resist by my art, by my word. And I'm not fearful for whatever occupation that tries to silence me and try to kill, to kill artists, authors, imprison them. My friend Darin Tatur, she wrote a poetry. Resist, my people resist, and she was taken to jail and tortured by the Israeli soldiers. So I'm saying that I'm going to resist. So as all the people who are going to resist, we might be hopeless for some days, but we will stand up because we cannot afford to be hopeless. We have a mission that is bigger than who we are. And we know that if I didn't see a liberated Palestine in my generation, we, are, we have to be working for a liberated Palestine for the second generation because nobody deserves to be occupied. Everybody deserves to be free, to travel free, and to have their full human rights for children, hum women, men, elderly, everybody with no exception. Sanita, you can unveil it. بدل ما انسخ عن اللوح بحضر فيديوهات لذيذة إذا باليوتيوب بيحكوا كوري ليش أتعلم إنجليزي؟ ليش في هالسد رياضة خلوني أرقد أنط وأسبح ولو بدل دروس الطبيعة أس الورد وأشوفه فتح ليش أنا قاعدة بالصف طلعوا ما أحلى الشمس ليش العالم دايما بيبدا بعد ما يخلص الدرس She was murdered by the occupation yesterday with her, with her mother and her siblings This is the children that you do not look at Thank you Okay, we're going to get to see something really beautiful now. This is the painting that will hang in the English department. Um, it's of um, Watu Khan. And anyway, come on. You can unveil it. Oh, come on. Come on. Get the other side. We're not going to do Q&A, but what we are going to do is um, some people are going to move stuff over to the John Young Courtyard, uh, Museum Courtyard. We invite everyone to come for the poetry and music. Again, that will feature um, Mahea Ahia, Ihimani Wasconia, Brandy Nalani McDougall, Haley Osorio, and John Osorio. Please come. There will be some refreshments. And um, if you are so moved, there are books and prints. And Malak will sign. Yeah. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, let's, give, let's give a really another round of applause for Malak. <laughs> Thank you for coming.